Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode today talking about anxiety. It's such a big topic. There's so much to know. Today, we're going to be talking about anxiety in the brain. It's not something that I necessarily go into quite a bit. I mean, there's so many variables that can contribute to anxiety. And I know we always come back to that nature nurture debate. Parents are always asking me about genetics and, and anxiety. It's not really useful to look at the causes of anxiety because there's so many different things that contribute to it. And asking why can get us really stuck. And we never want to get there, right? We, we, we want, we've got to get out of that stuckness with anxiety and we don't want to keep spinning our wheels asking why. I do, however, tend to focus on the nurture side of things when it comes to treating anxiety, because it's usually things that are in our environment or how people are responding that maintains that anxiety. And so those factors we definitely do need to address. So the nurture is almost more important when it comes to treating, because we got to look at, are there those accommodations that aren't helpful or unhelpful responses? that other people are doing. Although the nurture side is so important today, I really wanted to talk a little bit about the nature part of anxiety and specifically about anxiety in the brain. We do need to understand what's happening in the brain because it does help inform our strategies and our interventions when we're working with anxious kiddos. And so it's really helpful for anxious kiddos to know for them what's happening in their brain right? And that their brain can be easily tricked and it can be easily overwhelmed. So, so that it's not even working properly. It's not thinking properly. And it tricks us to think that something bad is really going to happen. So by teaching them about the brain, we can help normalize that anxiety. That's the whole point of it. It just, it just makes it not seem so big and scary and dangerous. So they can be like, Oh, I know exactly what's happening in my brain right now. And they can start calling their own brain out on it. Oh, here we go. Right. So I don't want to overwhelm, but I'm going to try to share as much information as I can that's actually going to be helpful when you're working with anxious kiddos and teens. And there's lots of different things happening in the brain. I talk a lot about the amygdala for ease of kids to understand, but in reality, there's lots of different brain regions that contribute to anxiety. And we call that the fear network. So yes, there's the amygdala, but it's a network of brain areas that interact with each other. So let's, let's look at this a little bit. Yes. It is true that sometimes kiddos are born with a more sensitive brain than others, right? And so their brain has trouble making some of the neurotransmitters that control mood. So those neurotransmitters, they're, they're essentially chemical messengers that travel through the brain. They tell the brain how we should feel and think and behave. So the common messenger chemicals that are linked specifically with anxiety, when we're looking at that, of course, the normal ones that we know, serotonin, GABA, and norepinephrine. So if we don't have enough serotonin, for example, we might feel anxious. Now, dopamine, that can often have a calming effect, which is why we see a lot of kiddos with diagnoses like ADHD or difficulties with the dopamine. Those messengers aren't traveling properly. They have a lot of emotion regulation difficulties because their dopamine messengers just start communicating properly to help them keep calm. But I do want to say, even though there are those neurotransmitters involved, I, I want you to get the idea of a chemical imbalance that happens in the brain out of your mind right now, because that's not a problem that needs to be medicated. The research nowadays really does not show a direct causal relationship or anything to say that this imbalance is only genetic. So we don't need to medicate our children when we know how to help them manage the anxiety in other ways. And so the work we do, it can actually change those neurotransmitters. We can actually change the brain through the effective work we do with anxious children and teens. So I want you to not think, even though I'm talking about neurochemicals and, and things like that, that that there, there has to be medication to regulate that balance. That's not true. So I just want to shift gears a little bit here and just talk about the different parts of anxiety that can affect the brain. So one part is the cognitive part. So that's where our anxious kiddos, they have lots of different worries, you know, that, that they're either talking about or they're thinking about or images and pictures that they have. These kiddos show a lot more left brain activity when they're nervous. The second part of the anxious brain is the feelings or, or the part of anxiety is the feelings. So the racing heartbeat, the nausea, the headaches, the tension, all of that, anything that comes out physically, those kiddos are showing more right brain activity. So what's interesting is that even different types of worries can affect different parts of the brain. So if we're thinking about it, it's on the left, if we're feeling it's on the right, but what is it that we're worried about? That's going to affect different parts of the brain too, which is really cool. So, and, and if you treat this, like, this is really cool. Let's figure out what part of your brain, right? It could be really interesting. I was actually just working with a kiddo. I've, I've made this brain book. Actually, I don't have one here. Um, 
I have this brain book that I've made for kiddos. And he was like, this is amazing. So this part of my brain does this and this part of my brain does that. Kids really get into this. So it can be really helpful. So kiddos who might have a phobia, for example, so maybe they're scared of dogs or spiders or anything like that. Bees is another common one. They tend to have more activity than kiddos without a phobia in their dorsal interior interior singular cortex. So it's your ACC that connects the emotion part of the brain with the cognitive, rational thinking, prefrontal cortex. And it's really important for helping us decide on what should we focus on impulse control, making good decisions, self monitoring our behaviors and our emotions. So this part of the brain actually amplifies the fear. So when you get a fear signal coming from the amygdala, it amplifies the fear. So, you know, I have a great story. I, I have a friend who she's so terrified of spiders. She's actually jumped out of a moving vehicle before. And that's the part of the brain, the ACC, you know, it's just not even communicating very effectively. And so she's got no impulse control, you know, so there's this little tiny harmless spider in the car and yet she flings herself from a moving vehicle, far more dangerous. So, you know, even just the picture of something, it doesn't even have to be a real spider. It could just be the picture of something that can make the brain start to scream. And then that makes the kiddo anxious. But for people who don't have problems in that part of the brain, nothing happens. You see a spider and be like, okay, let's take it outside. My girls are like, yeah, okay, let's just dump it outside. So the prefrontal cortex, that's what helps us to think rationally. And it helps us process information in a logical way instead of an emotional way. It's sort of the calming part of the brain that dampens the amygdala's warning bells. So this part of the brain essentially says, hold on, let's think about this, right? It's just a little spider. Nothing's going to happen. There's no reason to jump out of the car. There's no reason to get so anxious. Just throw it out the window, right? We don't have to set off the alarm. So it's dampening. It's trying to control that amygdala. But when that part of your brain's not working, there's no brakes on the amygdala. And so the signals, they just start flying around to create that anxiety. So that's another piece. Now the insula, it's also affected. So that's important for self-awareness and pain processing. And then the thalamus, of course, that's important for relaying sensory signals and it helps us regulate our sleep and alertness. Now, kiddos with generalized anxiety, they tend to have a weaker connection in the communication pathways between the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cortex. Panic attacks, that usually happens when our anxious kiddos have a really overactive amygdala. There's, there, I mean, a lot of them do anyways, all of them have overactive amygdalas, but that's where that piece really generates more from there versus the ACC, for example. So the point here is we see how anxiety can affect the different pathways in the brain. But in each of these cases, at the end of the day, the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain, it easily hijacks our prefrontal cortex. It just takes over. So there's no thinking rationally. There's no staying calm. There's no monitoring our reactions. There's no listening, you know, when you're like, just calm down. It's okay. It's not a big deal. That part of the brain is offline everything seems like a big deal. So that's why I usually only ever really talk about the amygdala because it just hijacks everything. That rational brain, that thinking part of the brain, it's not being heard because the connections from it are so weak. And anxiety, it just weakens those connections more and more and more. So it's kind of like just a muffled muteness that's happening. There's just no signals coming from that prefrontal cortex to say, wait, Let's think about this first. Let's calm down. The rational brain becomes ineffective at its job. And so, I mean, its job really is to tame that emotional brain. And so we see this spiraling of irrational thoughts when that logical brain isn't being heard. And we see these anxious behaviors and then sleep is affected and that just makes everything worse. So our job in the work that we do is to help anxious kiddos get that prefrontal cortex, that rational part of the brain back online as quickly as they can when they feel anxious so that they're not being flooded and spiraling. Ideally, if we can make it so that that amygdala doesn't get the prefrontal cortex offline in the first place, fantastic. But if it is, you know, if a kiddo is startled or is scared, let's get that rational thinking on back online. That's what we need to do. So I've talked about uh, neurotransmitters. I've talked a little bit about the different regions of the brain. Now there's also hormones that can affect the brain chemistry and contribute to anxiety as well. Of course, the big two, adrenaline and cortisol, those are the big ones. So those are released when our amygdala sets off that fight or flight alarm, and it causes a lot of the physical symptoms. So when our amygdala detects danger, it's, helping, it's telling our hypothalamus to 
get going, wake up your pituitary gland, which then releases all of the messengers to our adrenal gland. So that's just, they sit right above our kidney um, in our backs there. Well, it's not really our backs, but above our, above our kidneys, our adrenal glands. And then ultimately they release the cortisol into the bloodstream to call the body into action. And it happens so fast, it, you know, milliseconds, it happens so fast to ensure our safety. Now our brain, remember, cannot tell the difference between if we're worrying about a test and if we're worrying about being, being eaten by a predator, right? So it's going to react in the exact same way, just as quickly, just in case it's a predator. And so we need to fight and run away if it is. So our body goes into high alert and our brain just floods our central nervous system with adrenaline, along with the cortisol to help the body prepare to manage something bad, something scary that's about to happen. Our brain can't tell the difference. So our body and everything reacts exactly the same. So we need all the blood to get to our big muscles fast. I talk about this quite often to get to our big muscles fast so we can get in you know, well, of course, we're obviously going to get an increase in heart rate, right? And we're going to feel the tension in our muscles because the blood's got to get there really fast so that we can run or fight. Then we need oxygen in that blood. So we start breathing really quickly and shallowly, which might make us feel lightheaded or headachy. All of these unpleasant things start to happen in the body. And that only makes an anxious child feel like, see, something else really is wrong. My whole body is starting to react. So those symptoms make the anxiety worse. This is really a dangerous situation for sure. Yes, yes, Yesterday, maybe it wasn't, but for sure today it is. And it just lets that anxiety seep in even more. And it just starts to take over and spiral because now we're really hyper alert to every potential threat around them. And so with our anxious kiddos, that sympathetic part of the nervous system, which is supposed to take over and calm us down once the danger is gone, it doesn't work anymore. And so for our anxious kids, they just get this rush of stress hormones that makes the brain release even more stress hormones and more stress hormones. So they're just feeling more and more anxious because there's nothing there to dampen it down until they're just completely overwhelmed. Big problem. <laughs> Thyroid problems, that's another one too that we got to look at because our thyroid, our thyroid, it, it's really important for regulating those neurotransmitters that I talked about. So the serotonin, the norepinephrine, the GABA. So we know if all of those are out of whack, then we can feel anxious. So there's so much that can be happening in the brain. And even if someone was born uber sensitive and it's on a long line of the family tree, everybody in the family tree is anxious, they come by it honestly. I don't want to get stuck there. Yes, there's things happening in the brain. Yes, the chemicals might be out of whack and things aren't working, and connections aren't working as good, but the brain is so incredible. So we can't blame DNA because even if it's in our DNA, we can still manage anxiety effectively and we don't need medications to do that. It's just, we got to know how to treat it. We know how to, we got to know how to respond effectively. We got to know how to encourage kids to start building those connections in their brain. So I, I, yes, it's important to teach our kiddos about the brain, but it's never helpful to tell them, and especially our teens as they get older, that they come by it honestly, or that they were super sensitive, even as a baby, because that really tells a story that anxiety is ingrained in who I am. And they start to attach their identity around this anxiety. And then they start to feel really hopeless that there's nothing that they can do because they have an anxious brain. But the very opposite is true. The brain is so flexible. It's so changeable. And so these kiddos, they can learn new pathways and new stories about themselves, which is really important. So I think that's the key. I mean, I didn't want to go into too much detail to overwhelm. I think the big takeaway here is that there are different parts of the brain that affects, you know, and even if you lay it, definitely we need to know about the amygdala. And even if you just talk about the left and right, you know, the right brain affecting all the physical sensations, the left brain affecting our thoughts and, and the images that we have, even just knowing those couple of pieces can be really helpful. And then understanding when the alarm, when that amygdala goes off, it's sending all of these messengers out to get that body prepared for fight or flight. That alone can make all the difference for, for kids to be understanding this is what's happening. I get it. It's not dangerous. It's, it's, it's not a real fire alarm, right? It's just these false alarms that are going off. So I'm going to leave it here for today. I do go into a lot more detail about uh, the, the brain, the different pathways of the brain, setting up different experiences to create those stronger connections in my Anxiety Compass Mastery Training Program. So you can definitely check that out if you want. In the meantime, 
goodbye for today. Help those anxious kiddos be bold and courageous, and I will see you next time.